Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Anna Stell from Notre Dame's Department of Theology, and it's uh, my joy to welcome you to this afternoon's session. The title of the session, Ever Ancient, Ever, Ever New, recalls, of course, one of the most famous passages in St. Augustine's Confessions. In Book 9, Augustine exclaims, Late have I loved you, beauty so old and so new, late have I loved you. Fusing imagery from Plato's Symposium with that of the Biblical Song of Songs, the passage explores the relationship between Augustine's awakened spiritual senses, perceptive of God's <coughs> immaterial beauty, and his physical senses, responsive to the beauty of lovely created things. For Augustine, these lovely created things ultimately serve their purpose as pointers to God, declaring, we did not make ourselves. Sacramentality, then, is an issue for us, as is temporality, ever ancient, ever new. What is the status of sacred art, religious art, for us today? How does contemporary sacred art relate to the masterpieces of the past? How might the beauty of such art become a cultural source of renewal for society? Here with us today are two remarkable men, Donnie McManus and John Haldane, who have thought deeply about these questions and can guide us in answering them. I'll introduce Mr. McManus first, and then after his presentation, Mr. Haldane. I think they might still be looking for John Haldane. Oh, he's over there. Is he, okay. Hi. Oh, there, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie McManus studied at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. He earned a master's degree from New York Academy of Art. In 2004, he founded the Irish Academy of Figurative Art. And in 2011, he co-founded the Sacred Art School in Florence, Italy. A sculptor, Mr. McManus places emphasis in his own work and teaching on the depiction of the human form and especially on the figures of Christ, Mary, and the saints. Drawing inspiration from a sentence in Gaudium et Space, Christ reveals man to man. Mr. McManus wants his artwork to serve that work of revelation, at once human and divine. Bringing young artists into apprenticeships with experienced artists, the Sacred Art School answers to a call issued by Pope, John, Pope St. John Paul and by Pope Benedict XVI to serve the needs of the church as new church buildings are dedicated, new saints canonized. At the same time, the Sacred Art School prepares artists for their vocation and apostolate as evangelizers, able to exert a formative influence upon society through culture. In this task, Donnie McManus has proven to be a model and an inspiration for many. He speaks to us today on the topic the timeless revelation of sacred art. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. I suppose uh, from the onset, I'll just get the name pronounced right. It's Doni, as in Tony with a D, Doni McManus. It's, it's very difficult for a lot of Americans because they always think it's Donny. Um, okay, so basically what I'm gonna go through here as quickly as poss possible is uh, just a series of works in chronological order and what I've been, what has emerged through those works. Basically, the way I understand the world is through my fingertips. So it's, it's less academic, it's more material. So by showing you the work, it'll unravel the whole story of how my ideas have developed. So uh, just to start off, uh, this image here <laughs> is, might be a little bit familiar, but it's, I, I put this up as a joking way of uh, illustrating the crisis in contemporary art. <laughs> and one of the crises we see in some of the, the contemporary art is, is this tin of um, uh, artists' creation. Uh, and this was in 1961. It gives you an illustration of how far we've fallen within contemporary art. This is uh, the urinal by uh, Duchamp, Marcel Duchamp, and he exhibited this in, first in 1917, so that's nearly a hundred years ago. 
So we're talking about an artistic statement, which I think was very clever at the time, because he was basically saying, art is dead. And it certainly was at this stage. This is just after uh, the First World War, a major crisis in identity and, and vision. And uh, the, the art world was, he was basically declaring that art was dead at that stage. It was like the, the end of the barrel as, as, uh, as where we arrived at that stage. So this, this statement I thought was very clever, but unfortunately it's been repeated ad nauseum for nearly 100 years. And this is, this, is, this is the thing I want to illustrate. This is where I have, uh, this is where I, I was trained in the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. They were regurgitating this statement uh, and I just rejected it. Uh, and because I rejected it, I was kicked out of the department. So mainly because of my, my interest in figurative art and beauty, uh, which is now a bad word in art school, art school um, and my faith. So two profoundly uh, objectionable things in a contemporary art school. This just gives you an illustration of how this uh, urinal idea has, been, has become very fashionable over the years. And this gives you an idea of how, how, how nasty has become, that, that, that we turn an image of Our Lady into a urinal. And that just gives you an idea of how nasty these people, they want to offend. The objective is to offend. If you can offend the, uh, the, large, the best things in life, then you have succeeded. That's, that's the objective. And the more people you offend, and the deeper the offense, the more greater an artist you are. That's the, that's the ideology. So when I was kicked out of the fine art department for not going along with those works of art, I went into a craft department uh, because I knew, at least in the craft department, I could develop some sort of a, a, a technique and a discipline as an artist. And I did these clocks and silver boxes and so on. Uh, and I represented Ireland as uh, a silversmith. This is in the National Museum of Ireland, um, and there was an exhibition that goes around it. So basically, I re re my degree show, even though the college really disliked me because of my Christian values, they gave me the lowest mark possible in graduation. But I won Graduate Designer of the Year, and I launched the, the, the new silver collection of Ireland, the, the, the contemporary silver collection was launched on, on my degree show. So it gives you an idea how, how biased uh, the school was. Uh, and the, I moved into a, an artistic sphere after this. I went back into sculpture and I was commissioned to do this statue of the Virgin and Child. And this is a satirical magazine in Ireland which covered it. But this, I was commissioned to do the sculpture of the Virgin and Child uh, for a drug and uh, alcohol rehabilitation centre. And the, uh, at the foot of this piece is, uh, is the Virgin is standing on a bottle and a syringe as symbols of drug and alcohol addiction. So it's like the contemporary serpent. And the chain is broken. So it's very, it's very literal language, very clear, because it was for a very poorly educated um, client. Uh, poor, these, these people are, are very poorly educated, the, the people who are suffering from, from in, in this, in this uh, clinic. So I wanted to communicate to them as clearly as possible and use Christian iconography and bring it forward. In the words of Cardinal Ratzinger in the spirit of the liturgy, he talks about forward in tradition, which, uh, which is the motto I use for my school in Florence, the Sacred Art School in Florence. Um, I gave it the title Sacred Art School because I wanted to be very clear what the vision was and the mission was. So if any students have a problem, I ask them, what do you not understand about the name of the school? <laughs> uh, sacred Art School, forward in tradition. So, um, so th that's what I've always wanted to do is, is to move the tradition forward, not to be stagnant. I think there's a, there's a terrible temptation to go backwards in tradition are to move forward without tradition. Both are completely useless. It's only when you go forward in tradition, it's that, that tension, the forward in tradition, that's where cultural renewal, profound cultural renewal happens. And that's what I want to initiate in my own work and the overflow of that is with my students and apprentices and, uh, and the schools that are founded. And I started off, the, the second commission I got was this piece for uh, the city centre of Dublin, it's called The Linesman. And uh, the way I approach this is, first of all, I do a sketch. This is a St. Joseph I did for DC. 
But it, first of all, you do a sketch, clay sketch about this size, get it approved by your client, and then you do the full scale piece. And once the full scale piece is done in clay, as here, you then make a mold. So you make a rubber mold to take all the detail, and then you put a plaster jacket on top of the mold to hold the form. So if you do that on either side of the form, so let's say you're doing this fist, you rubber, rubber, plaster, plaster, and then you open it up. And then you take out the clay, and then you uh, paint, that's the open mold there, and then you paint wax inside the mold, like, a, like an Easter egg or a chocolate sante. <laughs> and once you, once you have the hollow piece done, then you invest it in ceramic shell. So that's the hollow sculpture there in wax. And you invest it in a ceramic shell, and then you melt out all the wax and you pour in bronze to where the wax was. Okay, it's just so you understand the process. So the, the piece is actually finished in bronze. After I did that piece, I uh, got a scholarship to go to the New York Academy, and uh, that was in 99. And there I learned artistic anatomy. Anatomy has an artistic language, so that has a grammar. So we studied anatomy uh, through millimeter accuracy of the bones and then putting on muscles from origin to insertion, every muscle. So it's to understand the grammar in a profound way. And that gave me an opportunity to contemplate the largest interest in my life, which is my faith. So this is the resurrected Christ from uh, Michelangelo's drawings. And I decided to study it through, a, through anatomy. So bone structure and then muscle structure. And then I decided to do a crucifixion because I felt the crucifixion to me is the most powerful image in history because it communicates the most powerful thing in history, which is love and God's love for his people. So to me, this was, uh, this was a primary objective of, of going to New York, to the New York Academy. So I made this as my degree show piece, um, and I decided to do it just in bones and muscles, so as to contemplate Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, in my primary language, which is form. So sculpting each bone and then putting the muscle on origin to insertion. And in the meantime, working with the design theories of Michelangelo. So Michelangelo's design theories, primarily you have the, uh, I have uh, Monsignor Timothy Verdon here who actually has <laughs> Michelangelo sculptures in his museum, but he has this theory. I hope I pass this one. There's the there's the pyramid and the spiral. So the pyramid is the structural balance of the piece, and the spiral is the movement. And the Pietà in in the Opera del Duomo is a perfect example of this. Uh, so you have the stability and movement, and Michelangelo inverts this in his crucifixions. So the pyramid is inverted. So you have uh, the triangle and then the spiral move. So the spiral move here and around the spiral. So this helps us understand that it's a, it's a continuation of the double helix and of the structure of the muscles around the bone. So it has this, this uh, propelling motion, this life force. Uh, while I was doing that, uh, I also did these two commissions, uh, St. Catherine and St. Josemaria for Washington, D.C. And um, after September 11, well, just be coming up to September 11, um, that was a pretty traumatic two months coming up to September 11 because I was working in, I was doing, I was looking after the homeless in, in uh, Midtown and I was looking after kids on Saturday in the Bronx. And... Um, Two of the kids I was looking after in the Bronx, their father was an NYPD cop, decided to take the family down, and he committed suicide in front of his family. And I was trying to help those kids deal with this. As I was coming home, I was staying in Queens at the time, uh, my next door neighbor, he committed suicide that same night. Uh, I found him at three o'clock in the morning on the ground. I got the, the fire brigade to come and the ambulance. Uh, so it was pretty, tra pretty traumatic at that stage. Two weeks after that, uh, the neighborhood in Queens burnt down. There, across the road, there was the, um, the pub and everything was burnt down. So everything I knew in Queens was gone. And then three weeks after that, the school I was attending, New York Academy, was burnt down uh, during our degree show. 
uh, and two of the firemen who rescued that crucifix from the Legree show were killed two weeks after that in September 11. So it was a very, very difficult period and uh, I was very close to being in, 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 in uh, just beside the towers. I decided to go to Mass. I, I, I made an appointment to meet a friend of mine at Mass at, at St. Peter's Church across the road from Tower 1 uh, at 8 o'clock and both of us changed our minds miraculously uh, and didn't tell each other, which was a real pain. Uh, on that morning, so that's Tuesday morning, so we would have been leaving that mass after Thanksgiving about 8.30 and we would have been about five blocks up the road on West Church Street when the first plane hit. The instinct would have been to go and help and the towers would have come down on top of us. So we both thought the other was there. So that was a very traumatic period. So I decided to return to Ireland uh, and sort myself out after that. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, when I got back to Ireland, uh, very, very bad news. Uh, my brother picked me up at the airport, so I thought things, things were pretty bad. Uh, and he told me that a mutual friend of ours had killed his wife and two kids and tried to commit suicide. So I was just totally shot at that stage because uh, my whole faith in humanity and everything was, was gone out the window. So I, I was tipped off to, for a commission in uh, St. Peter's Basilica to do a statue, a, a five meter marble of St. Escriva, founder of Opus Dei. So I went over to try and get that job, uh, didn't get it, uh, another guy got it. And, uh, but while I was there, I spent three weeks drawing the Pietà. And those three weeks were, were very, very revealing to me uh, because uh, they helped me, they healed me. And this is the reason I went through this, this story so that you understand. I drew the Pietà from three different angles. And uh, I spent a week on each. And it, it's, the reason I say this is because drawing is not just a process. It's a way of being. It's a way of penetrating reality and contemplating reality in life. And uh, just drawing the Pietà was such a healing moment for me because I realized it, it redeemed my faith in humanity. It redeemed my faith in God. And it actually helped me realize that my vocation as an artist could be a very powerful thing if I invest everything, everything into it, which means just sacrificing everything for it. And I decided at that moment that's what I was going to do. Because if Michelangelo could heal me after 400 years uh, through this lump of stone, then at least if I had just grasped a tiny percent of what he had achieved and brought that forward, maybe I might be able to heal others. And that has been my mission ever since. This led me, when I was in Rome, I, I got this studio out in the outskirts of Rome, uh, with pretty rough area. I was basically with uh, gypsies and hookers for a year. <laughs> it was really rough. It was, I was basically living in a factory, an old factory, burning wood to stay warm. Uh, but I needed, the, I needed the space and I needed cheap because I was doing a ton of work for, for clients in the US. Um, there's four life-size bronzes in DC and another two in New York and New Hampshire and, and, and um, Florida. So I was churning these things out um, in, in Rome because I wanted to, to be with the great masters. I wanted to dialogue with the great masters and, and an artistic anatomy gave me that access to the masters. So I had the two primary things that I needed, which was the thought of the masters, which was primarily uh, Greco-Romano, Judeo-Christian thought. It's, it's, it's uh, Christian philosophy, the theology and Western philosophy. And I, mix, and I could interpret that through the artistic anatomy as a language. So I could converse with Michelangelo and Bernini in the flesh, or in the marble, as you might say. So that was a great opportunity for me to really grow. And through that, I developed these, com uh, these compositions. For instance, when I did that crucifix, a priest came to my studio and said, what you're doing is very interesting. It's very like John Paul II's Theology of the Body. I said, Theology of the what? And he said, Theology of the Body. I said, oh, that's very interesting. So I got into that. I used Christopher West's material to get into it, first of all. And uh, it would profoundly change my life because it redeemed my whole understanding of who I was. And it helped me to touch my friends, uh, in particular friends who are in great difficulty in, in the area of sexuality. For instance, one of my friends, uh, he was one of the models in New York Academy, he was homosexual, and he came into my studio and said, Donny, I'm homosexual, 
you're Catholic, how do you feel about me being homosexual? Look, I said, look, you have the same, uh, we are, uh, I, I, I expect the same, I hold you to the same responsibility for your sexuality as I do for my sexuality and everybody else's sexuality. For me to deny your, your responsibility for your sexuality is to deny your dignity as a human being, and I love you too much to do that. And he broke down crying. And it was only through theology that Bali Dai actually had that ability to communicate on that level. Uh, and that was a profound change for me because I could help myself sort out my own issues and those of my friends in a very profound and beautiful way. And over years and years uh, of uh, sharing the theology of the body, uh, pretty much every week from 1999, since the last century, uh, I've been sharing this, and uh, it's, it's, it's transformed many, many lives. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a great uh, relief for me, and a, a great, uh, a powerful help in my own life. And it influenced my work. This piece was, it was composed, I did this from my head, basically using anatomical language. Um, and it's, it's, it's a symbol of theology of the body. So the child at the top, and then there's a skeleton at the bottom. And basically, I'm using my artistic anatomy skills to compose this. As would have, I uh, don't want to compare myself to the great masters, but Raphael and Michelangelo would have composed in a similar way. Not needing models, but because they understood. And that meant that they had a much uh, more lucid vocabulary to communicate and made them so great. So that's what I was trying to work with here. And you can see that the female body is quite different from the male. In, in the, the fatty pads and, and so on. So this helps you to understand the structure of the human body in a different way, uh, so as to actually understand that grammar, which communicates a deeper reality, a deeper complementarity. This piece was done in my studio in Rome, uh, and I was ba it was based on a Bernini I saw in Rome. So this piece is, uh, oh, same to scribe, it's, it's, it's for the headquarters of Opus Dei in Manhattan. And this piece, uh, you can see in its context, uh, I was asked to do this life-size figure for this chapel, and it would be very dominant, so I was trying to respect the hierarchy, the liturgical hierarchy, which is the tabernacle number one, uh, the, altar, the altar of sacrifice, and the, the altarpiece. And then the, the devotional work would be uh, on the third order. So in order to, to respect that, I looked to Bernini and I saw the solution there. He has this triangulation, this theatrical triangulation, where you go in, and when you see the saint, you're guided towards the tabernacle. And uh, it was a beautiful solution. And this is what you achieve when you start to dialogue with the great masters. And this is what I encourage my assistants and my students to do. Uh, this is a marble version of uh, the piece I'm doing as well at the moment. Now this is my mea culpa, <laughs> this is my dark period. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, when I was back in Dublin, I applied for about 15 different um, different commissions, uh, public art commissions, and they were all figurative compositions. None of them got anywhere. And uh, one morning, I found this application form under my bed, and I realized, oh my god, I have only three hours to put in an application for this. So I just banged out this crazy thing, this design, and uh, of course it won. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I'm convinced the reason it won is because it has absolutely zero continuity. There's nothing. It means absolutely nothing. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it was a revelation to me. It, was, it means absolutely nothing, but it got me 50 grand to get the school in, front, in, 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 in Dublin off the ground, so that was, that was good. <laughs> but now I have this uh, 40 meter turd on the side of a motorway. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but anyway, they, they, they built some trees around. <laughs> So this piece here is a, a Madonna, and child, Madonna and Child I did for my local church in Dublin. Uh, and this is a St. Joseph and the Child Jesus, which I did for a church in Florida. Actually, when I did this piece, I had to change the, the they do commission and asked me to change the head five times. So the five, fifth time I said, I'm just going to put on the original head because I much prefer it. And she said, yeah, that's the one I want. <laughs> so I had to keep your mouth shut, take the money and go. And so, <laughs> This is a bust of, uh, of um, John Paul II. I just I put this in because I, I did this uh, 10 busts, which is, uh, this, this is a reward that's given every year to the prominent Catholic in the United States uh, by the Catholic Information Center. But John Paul II is a, is a major influence for me. Uh, he really, uh, 
he's the foundation of everything that I've done. So basically his letter to artists in 1999 just basically propelled me and I've been running ever since. And it's, it's a must read for anybody who's interested in contemporary art. This is the Irish Times. John, John writes for this, or used to write for this newspaper. This is the first uh, write-up I had, uh, which was just around the time I, I left Ireland to go to Italy. When I was in Italy, uh, I met John Paul, uh, I met Pope Benedict uh, three, twice in one week. It was amazing. Monday, more, uh, Monday, he gave me a rosary bead. The next day, I <laughs> Georg on the right, uh, Monsignor Georg, you know, Archbishop Georg on the right. I met him in the uh, Vatican Gardens. That's not the Vatican Gardens, obviously. Uh, and uh, he, we had a chat. He was very interested. I told him about this Vatican Academy of Art idea. I, said, Look, I was saying to him, Look, there's a Vatican Academy of absolutely everything except art. Because <laughs> uh, anybody who thinks about the Vatican, they think about the church, and they think about art. Uh, and there's no Vatican Academy of Art. So I suggested it to him, and I told him the whole idea. And he was fascinated by the project. So the ne he asked me for my car. We were talking for a long time. And he asked me for my card. I gave him my card. And the next day, I had the opportunity to meet the Holy Father again. And Georg was standing right beside him. So I thought, oh my god, this is a great opportunity. Why don't I just uh, uh, chance my arm here? Um, uh, and I would said, uh, un proposta Santa Padre, un academia de bell'arte del Vaticano. Uh, un pro a proposal, Holy Father, a Vatican Academy of Art. And I gave him an image of St. Joseph. He was Joseph Rastinger. And uh, I left, I gave it to him, and then Georg was standing right beside him. <laughs> uh, so, but Georg could explain the whole thing to him. And shortly after that, there was initiated a, a, a master's in sacred art, art and, and, and architecture, uh, which I attended, and um, which is now is influenced uh, the pontifex. Some of the people who are involved in that are involved with David in pontifex. This is a bust I did of uh, Pope Benedict for uh, St. Patrick's in New York City. Uh, now, I started, at this stage, I started the school uh, in the Beato Angelico studio in uh, San Marco in Florence. And uh, I started teaching anatomy, and this is the studio space that I was given. And this is when um, Monsignor Timothy Verdon visited me with uh, Cardinal Batori on that uh, a very eventful Saturday morning, and uh, that's when the whole idea of the Sacred Art School was launched. Um, now, the way I teach anatomy is, is basically, uh, I kind of break it down into a very simple grammatic language. So, uh, instead of having to learn all the names and muscles, I just break them into groups. So, there's, there's extensor group and flexor group. So, the green are extensor group, a bit of Monty Python here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you have abductor, adductor, okay? So orange and blue. And this breaks it down, and then yellow are rotators. So just five colors, two complementary groups. It makes it really easy for artists to understand the mechanics of a body. And once you understand that, it's much easier to interpret and understand what's happening in a body in the model before you, and uh, interpret that in your own uh, artistic language. So I use that anatomical logic to unpack the poetry of form, okay? So I took that anatomic logic and I use it to decode a great mystical uh, artist, Pontormo. So this is Pontormo's drawing on the right, and I put the transparency on top of his drawing and pulled out the skeleton with my little friend here, Gerald. And uh, Roderick is the muscle figure on the other side. So between the two of them, I managed to pull out the bone structure and see how the bone structure was uh, designed. And with the bone structure, uh, first of all, I took out uh, this transparency went on top of this, pulled out the bone, so you can see the movement of the bone. And then I put this transparency on top of the bone structure, on top of the drawing, to see the abstraction of the muscles. Graceful movement. So you can see the dance, that's the graceful movement, uh, which I see as the spirit speaking through the body. So I'm trying to use science to unpack the poetry and the mysticism in the composition. So the bone structure illustrates the dance. The muscle structure illustrates the grace of form. And the drapery illustrates the billowing movement of the Holy Spirit. So it was in that five minute demonstration 
that uh, Osamu, a Japanese student, converted. And I, 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 he, he, he recalled this after his baptism. I asked him uh, as we were walking out of, the bat uh, out of the Duomo in Florence after his baptism, what was it that made you want to be Catholic? And he said it was that five minute demonstration. Because he realized it w he could not argue with that, that if he wanted to create mystical beauty in his work, he would have to embrace the fullness of the faith. And that, I believe, is at the root of all these conversions because over the years, there have been 11 guys that have, and girls that have been baptized through uh, the, the workshop and through this, this vision. So when you superimpose all these uh, images on top of each other, you get the bone structure, muscle structure, and drapery, you start to see how Pontormo saw the human body. Uh, now I gave this. Uh, I was invited. I gave this as a TED talk uh, th four years ago in the Palazzo Pitti, uh, Palazzo, the Sala Cinquecento, and the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. They uh, they showed every one of these videos. Uh, they on their web page. The only video they didn't show was mine. Uh, I I think it's because of the Catholic content is the only way I can understand this. Uh, this is, gives you an idea of how uh, you can analyze uh, muscle structure and isolate the, the, the anatomical logic and you can see how that anatomical logic is turned into poetic beauty on the other side there. This is Pontormo's drawings. This is one of the first guys who were baptized. This is uh, Cody who is now uh, head of sculpture in the Sacred Art School in Florence. Uh, and that's Cody with his wife. They were both baptized together and the next year Actually, the year before this, Cody, Cody's father, who's there on the right, Cody's father said to Cody, a year before he was baptized, he said, if they were in Rome at the time, he said, if you ever become a Catholic, I'll make sure you never have children. Very, very, very st st tough thing to say. So, sure enough, Cody was baptized. He, uh, I, I prepared both of them for the year. We're going through the catechism cover to cover. And uh, at the end of that year, his father asked if he could participate in the catechesis. Uh, I was a bit nervous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he participated. But it was very interesting because when Carlo Battori, the Archbishop of Florence, was uh, washing the feet of the Florentines uh, three days before the baptism of his son and his uh, daughter-in-law, he was, uh, Cody's father was sitting in front of me and I could see his shoulders jumping. And he was crying because he realized all his prejudice, anti-Catholic prejudice, was gone out the window. And as we exited the Duomo, it's just like Osamu, as we exited the Duomo that night, he asked me if he could participate in catechesis for the next year, so he could be baptized. So the next year, Cody's father was baptized with his first grandchild, which is poetic, along with Osamu, the Japanese student you just saw. So that gives you an idea of why the Archbishop of France was so interested in coming with uh, Monsignor Verdon to the studio to find out what the hell's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> because it's something very beautiful happening. Uh, and that's what, was, uh, what started the school. And I put it down to the grace of Beato Angelico uh, and his, the graces that were moving through his, his studio and his Dominican order. There's Cody on the left, and that's Osamu on the top right. I broke them into teaching by teaching kids in Florence, first of all. And it was called a group called Piccolo Michelangelo, because Michelangelo started when he was only 14. So I got these little young kids in Florence to, to learn uh, their faith through art. And Cody and Osamu helped me do that. It's, it's as a, a self-confessed punk kid from Hawaii. And uh, 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 Osamu's... Um, a junkie from Tokyo, <laughs> both came and converted, and now they're bringing Florentine kids back to the faith, uh, which is really a grace, a phenomenal grace. This is the altarpiece I was doing, uh, which uh, Monsignor Verdon helped me with, uh, just some recommendations, um, theologically. But uh, I illustrate, put this up here just to illustrate how important theology is to the, to the creation of a work. You have to have a very clear idea in order to communicate uh, in a clear language. So basically, the, the idea here is the descent of the Holy Spirit and the Apostles, 
and I put the Virgin in the middle, so the tabernacle is coming out from the Virgin. So the descent of the Holy Spirit and the apostles is the birth of, of the church. And I also wanted the Virgin giving birth to the church through the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the St. Peter's on top of the Holy of Holies of Jerusalem, so the Old Testament, New Testament connection. And at the base is Cosmos from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Uh, so it's, it's the revelation of the Holy Spirit onto the world. So the Holy Spirit comes down onto the church and through the church it breaks through the wings of this angel at the bottom and penetrates the forehead of Cosmos. So it's the Holy Spirit coming to us through the church. Uh, this is the, the foundation of the school, this is the board of the school. And this is the first project we did in the Duomo uh, for, with the school. This is how I generally work. This is, uh, I move, start moving into painting. So this is a drawing I did, a composition of an altarpiece for the Knights of Malta in St. Peter's, uh, in, uh, in Dublin. And uh, this is the painting I worked from that. I have to race through this, uh, unfortunately. This is Fulton Sheen that I was working on in my backyard in Dublin for a while, and this has been, unfortunately, the plug has been pulled on this job. Um, and that was the Archbishop of Dublin doing it. These are the next two guys to look out for. Uh, the far one there is, um, is Mark, and Mark was baptized two years ago in um, London, and Michael hopefully will be baptized next year, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, Francis. These are two pieces I did in, in Chicago recently, so they're on terracotta. And this is the piece I'm working on at the moment, the facade for a church in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm doing this in my studio in Manhattan. And uh, so it's an enlargement. And these are the uh, number of pieces that I'm doing there. This is three pieces I'm doing in Dublin at the moment for Belfast. And this is the facade of the church where I'm doing the mosaic. So that. This is 48, uh, four, 24 by uh, 28 feet uh, mosaic. And uh, this is the Theology of the Body piece that I've just been uh, working on. So this is a fountain of life, but I don't have time to go into it right now. Okay, that's everything, I think. Oh, we, have, we have time for it, right? Yeah. Thank you very much. if we're going to have time for questions after this session. So we look for the speakers afterwards, and I, um, it's um, very sad to cut short such a delightful presentation as we've just heard um, by Domi. All right, our second speaker, uh, John Haldane, is the inaugural, inaugural holder of the J. Newton Razor Senior Distinguished Chair in Philosophy at Baylor University. After earning his doctorate in philosophy at the University of London, Mr. Haldane joined the philosophy department at St. Andrews University in Scotland. He's given named lecture series at Cambridge University, Aberdeen University, the Gifford Lectures, Rome's Gregorian University, Oxford University, and the University of Lublin. The recipient of several honorary doctorates, Professor Haldane is the author of over 200 academic articles and five books, most recently, I believe, <laughs> Reasonable Faith. A fellow at the Center for Ethics and Culture and at the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, he serves as consultant for the Pontifical Council of, for Culture. His interest in art and aesthetics is long term. This might be surprising to some of you. He earned a BA in Fine Arts at the University of the Arts in London, where he also taught art and later lectured at the Architect School at the University of Westminster. We're really honored to hear him speak to us today on the topic, Beauty Then and Now, Contrasting Pre-Modern Christian and Modern Secular Views. Please join me in welcoming John I, uh, and in one way moved away from it, but not by being thrown out and then having to create my own uh, education in that way, uh, but by turning to philosophy. Um, but I um, uh, did five years of art school and, and 
uh, continue to be uh, very interested in, though we don't have the time for um, uh, the practice of it. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, in this session um, is uh, something uh, about the nature of beauty, at least as philosophers uh, and others have thought about that, theologians also. Um, and then uh, say something about um, contrasting, uh, as the title suggests, pre-modern Christian and the modern secular views. When I get to, uh, I'll talk briefly about uh, some recent artists, only one of whom, like Dolly, is figurative. Uh, and in that case, that artist actually, um, his medium really, his thematic medium was um, still life, uh, rather than a human figure in that way. So. Um, let's just make sure. First of all, I want to just say, yeah, we've got that there, looks fine, good. So, um, this is in a way an example, I mean a brief illustration of an example of a general uh, project or a general approach that I'm interested in, um, which I would call here a study in engaged cultural history. Um, and in another context, and perhaps with more time, I'd be um, making an argument encouraging people to think in terms of this kind of approach to study and engage cultural history. Um, as I think about it, such an approach has really sort of three dimensions. On the one hand, it's historical, not merely chronicular. chronicular. Um, and what I mean by that is I mean, the distinction between chronicles and history is that chronicles typically, I mean, in, in the development of history writing in, in the West, we move from uh, phases of merely chronicling to phases of history. So chronicles just tell you uh, one thing after another, really. I mean, uh, some literary forms preserve that until quite late. The Icelandic sagas, often uh, large parts of them are just chronicles, really. Uh, but then they develop a narrative structure and so on. But a history attempts to do more than a chronicle. It, it, it offers, in part, an interpretation. And uh, so I'm interested in looking at cultural history through the, the lens or by picking up aspects, or applying aspects rather, of analysis, explanation, and evaluation. Uh, secondly, um, the sort of method I'm interested in is not sociological, it's genuinely cultural. That's to say, it employs art critical perspectives and methods, so it's another aspect of it's being engaged. And then thirdly, it's philosophical and not psychological, that's to say, it engages themes and theories in the philosophy of art and beauty. So, historical, cultural, and philosophical. Now, um, at this point, let me go philosophical. If we're interested in art, but not only uh, uh, art, but say natural beauty, um, our business then is to try to get some understanding, if we're philosophically minded or philosophically inclined, uh, some understanding of what aesthetic experience is, whether it's the experience uh, of created objects, I mean, humanly created objects, or whether it's the experience of nature, or whether it's a kind of experience that itself is going to inform artistic uh, activity. Most people who have aesthetic experiences will not themselves uh, have the capacity or perhaps even the interest to make art, but they will be responding to art or to nature. Um, so aesthetic experience really moves in, direct, in two directions. I mean, in part, it's a sort of reception of beauty in some way or another, uh, but also it, it plays its role in the uh, Con conceiving and implementing of schemes for the making of beauty. Now, um, a general account of aesthetic experience is going to have to say something about each of these four elements. The aesthetic object, the aesthetic experience, the aesthetic attitude, and the aesthetic subject. And um, just very quickly, by the aesthetic object, I mean that entity or entities or quality or qualities that are the proper objects of aesthetic experience. Now, when I say the proper objects of aesthetic experience, um, that's not an evaluative term. I don't mean proper as opposed to improper or something of that sort. What I mean is, in some sense, logically speaking, what the proper objects are. So, for example, different sensory powers are defined by reference to their objects. So what makes something a sight in a creature is that its proper object is the visible. Uh, what makes something hearing in a creature is that its proper object is the audible. Um, what makes something touch in a creature is its proper object is the tactile and so on. So the senses are defined, and this is the logical point, uh, are defined in relation to their proper objects, the range of objects over which uh, they, they, they uh, have detected power. And then, um, so an aesthetic experience is 
the kind or state that is proper to the aesthetic object. And again, I'm using proper in that sort of quasi-logical sense, right? It's the, just as the visible is the proper object of sight, then the aesthetic object is the proper object uh, of aesthetic experience. And then the third thing we want to try to understand is the aesthetic attitude, the distinctive way or ways of thinking or feeling associated with having aesthetic experience. And then finally we have the aesthetic subject, the being or art or aspect thereof, that has the aesthetic experience. Now, uh, so a full account, full, full philosophical account of these matters is going to have to say something about each of these four elements. But not only, I think, that, it's going to have to say something about the order of priority between them. That's to say, um, do they stand independently, or is there some sense in which uh, one or other of these is fundamental, and we can explain the others uh, in terms of that. Now, um, I put at the bottom here, the historical movement, uh, the movement from um, the ancient world through the medieval world to the modern world to the recent and contemporary world, is uh, among philosophers, among those who think in these terms about these sorts of things, is uh, to move from a situation in which it was, oh, sorry, it was the case that the, um, the uh, aesthetic object was the primary <coughs> element. And you explained aesthetic experience in terms of being the experience of that kind of object. An aesthetic attitude that was the attitude that was induced by an aesthetic experience that had that object. And then the aesthetic subject is one who goes into the attitude in which they have the experience, which is responsive to the object. Um, historically, uh, as we get into the modern period, but particularly from the 18th century onwards, there's a reversal of that. And so um, in contemporary uh, philosophical aesthetics, and this has been so for the last three centuries, uh, people think that there aren't aesthetic objects per se, that anything can be an aesthetic object. Um, and I mean, Duchamp's urinal comes onto the scene here. Of course, Duchamp was making a different point. He was making a point about the, the status of art objects as those were constituted by the institutions of art and so on. But there is a sense in which you might think that anything could be, I mean, perhaps even a, a urinal could be an aesthetic object on this view if uh, it's the object of a certain kind of experience which is a manifestation of a certain attitude which is possessed by a certain subject. But in that case, what makes something an aesthetic object is explained from the bottom upwards. And that contrasts with um, the ancient and medieval period in which the aesthetic object typically characterizes beauty as primacy. And I guess, Dodi, that's probably a view that you would concur with. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to say any more about these than just the titles of them. Uh, in this larger project, which one's trying to sort of have a look at the ways in which beauty has been conceived of, then there are five broad historical phases, antiquity and early Christian centuries, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and the modern and contemporary. I don't say any more about that. Now, uh, Donny mentioned this, actually, and uh, what he had to say, talking about Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian uh, influence, and so on. So far as medieval aesthetics is concerned, there are really uh, two sets of sources. On the one hand, Greek and Roman philosophy, and then, um, Within that, really, principally two sources, actually. Uh, one, Plato, the Hippias Major, the Symposium of the Republic. And secondly, and actually, as it turns out for the, for the medievals, uh, very importantly, perhaps even more importantly than Plato, uh, Plotinus. Um, and the relevant source there would be Aeneas 1.6. Now, uh, both Plato and Plotinus um, think of beauty as objective as ideal and causative. Now, this idea of the, the, the first of those, beauty as objective, that, of course, fits with that view that you explain the aesthetic object. First of all, you have a theory of the aesthetic object, and then you say aesthetic experience is experience that is defined relative to that object, just like sight is the power that is defined relative to the visible. And so um, beauty is conceived of as, a, as objective, ultimately as ideal, not even, as it were, uh, ultimately not an object of sense, but an object of intellect, and in some way or another causative, as somehow that the, the perfect form of beauty somehow produces, perhaps through the minds of artists, perhaps in some other way, produces um, instantiations of beauty at lower levels than the hierarchy. And that hierarchy then is um, one of, uh, if we proceed, so uh, the, the medievals, uh, 
And others will draw a distinction between the order of ascendi and the order of cognoscendi, the order of being or essence, and the order of discovery or knowledge. And those are the reverse of one another. So in the order of being, um, we move from the ultimate to the abstract, to the intellectual, to the moral, to the bodily, and the sensual. But in the order of discovery, we start with sensual beauty, and then we move to a broader notion of bodily beauty, and then moral beauty, intellectual beauty, some abstract conception of beauty, and then this ultimate ideal that is the object no longer of sight or hearing and so on, but um, uh, of intellect. And of course, you could see the connection here with the ancient theory that music is mathematics made audible, right? So that uh, in the musical, one proceeds in that way. That gives an illustration of what it might be, that you start off by listening to music, but what ultimately the mind moves towards uh, are mathematical realities. Now, the other source, of course, is Hebrew and Christian scripture, uh, mainly Genesis, Wisdom, and Psalms. And here's the sort of thing that we hear there. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. From the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature has been clearly perceived in the things that he has made, Paul Romans. Paul isn't here, of course, explicitly speaking about beauty, but you can see the application of the general idea that uh, the features, as it were, of the author are manifest uh, in the work. Uh, worth saying, I'm not going to talk about this now because there really isn't enough time, but um, people sort of forget often that the, the Christian empire, I mean, it was, it, it was developed then in the, the east with Constantinople as its center, um, uh, the second Rome and so on. And of course, it is worth remembering that the eastern empire out uh, lived the Western Empire by a thousand years. So the Eastern Empire continues into the 15th century. And if one's looking at the legacy of Greece and uh, of Greek culture and of Roman culture and its influence on Christian thought, it's extremely important not to forget the Eastern Empire. Because really, it's, um, there's a bit of a division between the West and East over the question of how the legacy of the Greek or Roman world intellectually and so on and aesthetically should be received, indeed whether it should be received at all. Right? And particularly in the East, uh, the Greek tradition continues on. I mean, the Greek tradi tradition of philosophy continues on. And the iconoclasm debates you know, begin and are resolved first uh, in the Eastern Church, and then they have an outbreak and are resolved uh, in the Western Church. But I'm not going to uh, say any more about that, except to mention uh, a couple of Church Far Eastern Fathers, Clement of Alexandria, in relation to the aesthetic, God is the cause of all that's beautiful, and the best beauty is spiritual. You can see again, in a sense, the connection with the Platonic idea that it's the ideal, not the tangible beauty, but the, 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 the material beauty. Then physical beauty, that's descending, as it were, in the order of being. The ratio of members and parts in conjunction with good color. Now, good color turns out to be very interesting in all of this, good color. Basil the Great, physical beauty derived from the mutual proportions of parts and the harmonious appearance of colors. With light, which is a simple and homogeneous essence, this symmetry is less shown in its parts than in the pleasure and delight at the sight of it. That somehow, as it were, the play of light, light itself and light's effects in the world, um, are become objects of a kind of pleasure and delight. God, God himself does not judge the beauty of his work, however, by the charm the eyes, obviously, um, and he does not form the same idea of beauty that we do, and then later, and God, then the, the passage, and God saw that his work was beautiful, what he's telling us, that Basil's telling us, what that actually means is that what he esteems beautiful is that which presents in its perfection all the fitness of art. Now that's really a kind of an, an analogy here, um, <coughs> to say that God is an artist is analogical because, of course, an artist takes some pre-existing material, fashions it in a certain way. That's not how God works, right? God creates ex nihilo, so he's not working upon material. But there is an analogy um, between God and the artist in that way. Now, uh, later on, we get in Aquinas um, in his uh, treatments, of, uh, which are not very extensive, actually, but interestingly come originally in his commentary on the divine names of Dionysius. And Dionysius, some of you will know this, that Dionysius um, is the figure, or believed to have been the figure, Dionysius the Areopagite, believed to be the figure whom Paul converted when he went to Athens. And Paul went to Athens, 
his experience with the philosophers were not, was not happy ones, uh, but he did make a convert. And um, the, uh, a, a story developed that that convert was a philosopher. And so it would be great prestige in converting in the first century of Christianity a philosopher from Athens to, to, to the Christian belief. And so this figure, Dionysius the Areopagite, then sort of crops up subsequently in history. And um, some works are attributed to him, one being on the divine names, another on the Trinity, and so on. So we'd get somebody who'd be a Greek philosopher who becomes a Christian and a Christian theologian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Di the, the author Dionysius is not, in fact, the individual whom Paul uh, converted, but is a fifth century Syrian monk. But um, such was the confidence and belief in this, and as I say, the prestige of it, that people produced commentaries on, on uh, uh, Dionysian works, um, particularly on the divine names. And Thomas Aquinas, it's by the way, in the generation of Thomas Aquinas, and slightly after, that people come to the conclusion that the author Dionysius is not indeed uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite. Um, but anyway, he, he tells us, I'm going to cut just down for reasons of time to this bit, Beauty, it says, includes three conditions, integrity or perfection, since those things are, are, which are impaired are by that very fact ugly, um, the proportion or harmony, and lastly, brightness or clarity, whence things are called beautiful which have a bright color. Now this is connected, this business about bright color, which we've encountered a couple of times, is connected to this tradition that emphasizes light. Um, now, light is seen in all sorts of ways. I mean, one aspect of it is I talked about uh, the beautiful as being a sort of ideal and so on, but also causative. For many of these people, um, they associate light with creation. And um, partly that's a sort of platonic theme, because light, as it were, light as emanating from the sun, is, uh, for many of them, they see that as part of, and this is true of Aquinas himself, actually, this is part of the productive creative process. Not just divine creation, but actually I mean, God obviously creates the light, but the presence of light is necessary uh, for reproduction. So for example, Aquinas believed in the spontane spontaneous uh, generation of life from inanimate matter. Um, essentially dung heaps and then beetles appear from them and so on. But what they observed was that you know, these things become hot and then they thought that there's a sort of inner cause of heat, but the ultimate cause of heat is the sun itself. So the sun, the sun, the light of the sun, uh, is a medium uh, communicating something from the source that is the sun and uh, contributes to um, uh, generation. So light is important in that way as a kind of causative principle, but it's important also because it illuminates, right? It reveals what's already there. It both makes things or contributes to their making but also reveals what is already there. And particularly, because what it reveals, it makes things visible. And we see things by seeing their colors, basically. Right? I mean, their tonality, their contours, and their color. But color and light, then, and the visible are all importantly connected. And so this becomes a major theme of medieval uh, thinking about beauty, that it's in some important way uh, connected with light. And of course, the metaphor of illumination as enlightening, illuminating the mind, and so on, then goes with that. So there's a thought that somehow, through the experience of beauty, we will become, as the beautiful object itself was, as it were, it was made visible, so to us something will be made visible, or something will be illuminated in us by the ultimate source of light, which is God. Now, um, so here's this kind of idea of light at work. This is Saint-Denis, and... Um, if, uh, I'm sure many of you have been to Paris, and if you've been to Paris, you probably did get to Saint-Denis, but if for, this would be an extraordinary circumstance to be in this situation, but if you were in Paris and you could only go to one church, uh, this is a more important church to visit than Notre Dame. Uh, aesthetically speaking, I think this is just a, it's, I mean, it's not a question of its fineness, it's a question of its historical uh, significance in the development of Western architecture. But anyway, Saint-Denis uh, is filled with light, see here. Uh, Abbot Suger, in his work on administration, the De Administrazione, he uh, says, bright is a noble work, but being nobly bright, the work should brighten the minds. There's the connection with the literal illumination and the 
spiritual or intellectual illumination, so that they may travel through the true lights to the true light, through the true <coughs> lights, the windows, to the true light where Christ is the true door. The dull mind rises to truth through that which is material, and in seeing this light is resurrected from its former submission. Now he does, he's thinking of this partly, of course, metaphorically, but also quite literally. You know, you're seated there, and there's a, your mind rises um, through these flutings and so on, um, and then you know, passes through the glass to the source of illumination. And then, um, you remember, we, we saw this earlier passage about how the delight in light and so on. Um, you see the play now of the light. It's not only that well, the eye is drawn through to the windows and through the windows to the source of light, the mind rather is drawn to the source of light, but the eye enjoys as well, the play of light uh, on the stone. And the stone is kind of brought to life. It's animated uh, by the play of light across it. And again, just to repeat that, bright is the noble work, but being nobly bright, the work should brighten the minds. So that they may travel through the true light, the true light where Christ is the true door. The dull mind rises to truth through that which is material, and in seeing this light is resurrected from its former submission. Um, this is, uh, he also writes in the same set of documents, uh, he says, the altar, the altar of wondrous workmanship and lavish splendor we have ennobled uh, with bas reliefs, so admirable in form and matter that some could say this surpasses matter. And uh, this isn't the original uh, altarpiece, but nonetheless, uh, but, and this is another altarpiece, but this is a 15th century painting, and you can see something of the glory uh, of, of what he has in mind. This theme about, um, about matter being transformed, we saw it in this and we saw it, I think, in the previous quotation, um, yeah, the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material. This issue about the material nonetheless having a potentiality to be a vehicle for the passage of the mind towards God is, I think, an extremely interesting theme. Uh, in a non-Christian context, um, maybe even a non-theological context, it's one of the principles of alchemy that the... Um, you know, the transmutation of base metal into gold is meant to be actually a metaphor or a parallel to a second kind of causative track, that it's the um, transformation of the base soul to the pure soul. And so one of the things the alchemists were interested in was the idea that there might be a sort of causal parallelism between the transformation of base metal to gold in the process of which whoever had mastered whatever technique was required for that would themselves have undergone a parallel process in the transformation from baseness to, through a process of refinement to spirituality. It's a very interesting idea, I think. But if obviously, in the Christian context, um, it's not by working upon the material in some ongoing process. The artist, of course, has transformed, alchemically transformed matter into something of beauty. And in the process, has made available beauty to us through which we can ascend that latter, la ladder of beauty to the cause of beauty, ultimate cause of beauty, God. Now, I want to sort of jump uh, from the medieval period to the, boy, uh, to the, 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 the uh, for reasons of time, I'm leaping over several centuries. But uh, I'm also moving into a world in which, I uh, remember that inversion. So I said that uh, in the ancient and medieval world, uh, people thought that you, you start off with a conception of beauty. That's, uh, that's the conceptual and ontological foundation of all of this, right? That beauty is first. And then we understand aesthetic experience as being an experience of beauty. And the aesthetic attitude is the attitude that is induced in you, say a contemplative, respectful, whatever else it may be, attitude induced in you by being caused to have that kind of experience by that kind of object. And then you become, as it were, an aesthetic subject in that sense through or through that process. Now, Beginning in the 18th century, particularly with Edmund Burke, David Hume in Britain, an Irishman and a Scotsman, replayed here today with an Irishman and a Scotsman. Um, but then Immanuel Kant, uh, we'll leave him to one side, um, a Prussian. Um, the, uh, unless we've got a third speaker who wants to leap up uh, representing Prussia just now. Um, the, 
they, they sort of psychologize all of this. So the idea they're going to reverse this. They're going to say, look, there's nothing that's an aesthetic object per se. It's a question of taking up a certain kind of interest in things. And that interest in things confers upon the objects their status as aesthetic objects. They don't have that. It's not an intrinsic property of things. It's rather a projection of our interest or sensibility. Now, um, of course, if you think in those ways, all that you could hope to learn from aesthetic experience is about the, something about the human subject. Because as I say, this, uh, you, you could seem to recover something, but it would be a recovery. It's a recovery of something that you've put there. So the aesthetic, in a sense, begins with us, with a certain attitude that we take. Um, that attitude brings us to certain kinds of experiences. But the aesthetic object is whatever, in some fundamental sense, we choose, or our sensibility determines it should be. Now, for various reasons, I think that's come to be felt to be unsatisfactory. And what I'm interested in, finally, is the attempt of artists in the 20th century, none of whom is working within a religious context, but I think can be seen to be doing something we, should, we as religious believers might want to applaud, is the attempt in some way or another to try to re-envision the world imaginatively in a way that, as it were, takes, is in one way or another uh, transcendent of human concerns. I mean, in some sense, it's going to, it, it begins with human concerns, but it's going to try to place those concerns appropriately or inappropriately, as the case may be, in the world. So it's trying to get some sort of measure between thought and reality, not just seeing us as projecting everything outwards, but in some sense having to try to answer to something that's not entirely of our making, while at the same time understand the harmony between uh, us and it. A lot more would need to be said about that. And I'll just mention four artists briefly, because time is short. Uh, one is Mirandi, an Italian um, a still life painter. Some of you will know Mirandi's work. He was very prolific. Um, he, his, one of his methods of working was to assemble these objects, but he would pre-paint the objects. Uh, when I say pre-paint them, he would actually take the bottle or the piece of wood or the box or what it was and actually literally apply paint to that. Part of that was to um, achieve a certain tonal unity that he was interested in, a chromatic and tonal unity. Um, and you look at a painting like that and you think, hmm, well, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Um, it is, he is a very fine painter, I think. Uh, but let me uh, try to sort of illustrate through another work, part of what um, uh, he's doing. Uh, he's imbuing these objects with meaning, and the particular meaning they have is human meaning. These are no longer inanimate objects. These are something like people. <coughs> So Mirandi, as it were, externalizes or takes the human into the world by transforming objects which in a way themselves then stand as characters. And um, in light of contemplating these paintings, it induces in us, or may induce in us, certain reflections about the human condition and our place in the world. So the, irreg oh, sorry, the irregularities in these works are not accidental. Right? It's not that he can't, as it were, get the symmetry of a bottle. He's done this deliberately. What he's actually doing is that these are metaphors for, as it were, the uh, sort of flawed condition of human life, right? We come in different <coughs> shapes and sizes. We're a bit bruised and battered. We're twisted or turned in various ways and so on. And notice, so that's one aspect of it, right? You actually have to see these as if each of these is a being living out its life in a world not of its own making under conditions it didn't choose. Um, the second thing is, notice the edge. He brings these objects forward and groups them rather sort of uncomfortably, you might say. So they don't as it were having breathing space around them. So there's a sense of well, the presence of others as not altogether being something comfortable. These are not objects existing in community. They're existing, as it were, in a restricted and confined space. And they're approaching an edge. So in a way, they're a little like uh, uh, actors on a stage, right? You could see this as a stage, and these are the actors on the stage. But notice there's a kind of precariousness about their position. And through all of this, I think what he's, these are, as it were, existentialist paintings. Right? I think he is exploring in various ways aspects of the human condition, and then, as it were, giving imaginative manifestation to that, and then inviting us to contemplate our condition through the work. So in some respects, it's not altogether unlike religious work. Because it's, it's in a sense, it is a portrait of the human condition conceived of in a certain way. 
not religiously, but these are proto-religious paintings. Somebody who is going to paint in this way is somebody who is actually pretty uh, really almost by pun, is primed for um, a religious belief. Um, different artists, different works. Some of you will know his work, of course, Mark Rothko. Um, Rothko, I mean, his inspirations are very different. Obviously, they tend to be sort of Eastern uh, mystical traditions and so on. I don't mean Eastern Orthodox, but uh, uh, Hindu and Buddhist, but more Buddhist, really. Um, what's interesting about this, I think that people's responsiveness, and it has been quite extensive to Rothko's work, is the sense of intimation of meaning, though I think the meaning may not be there. Um, the ne next artist is Agnes Martin, fine painter, actually. Um, I'm afraid an Agnes Martin is rather difficult to illustrate because part of, if you've seen Agnes Martin's work, uh, she would draw on canvas with typically with a hard pencil, actually, so the lines are extremely faint, uh, and use a very, very light palette and a rather restricted range of colors. So you've got a kind of modulation that is not, in some respects, altogether unlike this. You know, it's a restricted rate color palette, but even much more restricted. And um, what Agnes Martin is, where is inviting <coughs> us to do, in a way, is see if we can find anything um, in those paintings. Uh, I mean, there are things. There's an aesthetic surface, of course. But in a way, these are paintings for people for an age that is not quite sure of the nature of the world it inhabits. It's not sure whether the world is a place of meaning or not. So there's a kind of ambiguity in these paintings. Right? There's a suggestion of the presence of something, and yet there's also a suggestion of absence. And I think Agnes Martin is a fine painter, and a very refined painter, and a very fine painter. But uh, like, uh, more like Miranda than like Rothko, I think she's also got a sort of refined moral sensibility. I think she's delicate in handling difficult things, which is, uh, the difficult thing is, the human on the edge of meaning or absence of meaning, unresolved in their own mind as to whether or not the world has meaning or doesn't. And finally, because I was talking about this artist last year, um, I think in this conference, in connection with something else, I threw it, thought I'd throw in a couple of these. Um, this is the artist Richard Long. I believe he's one of the, he's probably the finest British artist of his generation, or certainly one of the three or four finest British artists of his generation. Um, uh, Richard Law's work, if you don't already know about it, uh, consists in simply, he, he makes very long walks. These walks might be a thousand miles. He works solitarily. He takes no materials with him into the landscape. He simply gathers in the landscape uh, from it, stones, pieces of wood, whatever else it may be, sometimes water poured and so on. This one is in the Sahara. Um, this is an early Richard Law. Um, he, uh, he, came, he began really as an artist when he was about 15 or 16. He was actually thrown out of art school as well. Um, um, but some years later, he was a, a, a winner of the Tate Prize, uh, various other honors and so on. But uh, this is an early piece in Ireland. And um, I think this work has a tremendous lyrical beauty, actually. Uh, I mean, it refers in different directions. One is obviously to the certain Celtic forms. We can see that. Um, you might also think that this was a rosary dropped on the surface of the earth. Um, it isn't, but you could see that there might be something in that. He described himself, he's a very taciturn person, he doesn't much, he's given interviews more recently in recent years. Every major art gallery in the world has a Richard Long in it. Every major art gallery in the world has a Richard Long in it. I mean, that, that's the sort of <coughs> status we're talking about. Um, New York has several, but you know, you can find San Francisco has them, Chicago has them, and so on. But, um, He's a very solitary man. He says almost nothing about his work. Uh, he spends nine months of the year away from home, traveling alone, uh, and bringing back uh, things like this. Well, of course, he doesn't bring them back. That's the point. He may stay in the, uh, in the original context. Now, I think, in, like Agnes Martin and like um, Mirandi, this is somebody religiously uninformed, um, but with a sensibility uh, that is primed for a religious encounter, as it were. This is somebody who takes very seriously the business of being in the world uh, and the mystery of being in the world and the business of being an artist, uh, given his entire life to this. It's cost him various things along the way. It's been rewarding for him as well. But um, 
it is in a way an exploration of the human condition. And in a sense, just as the, the early figures we talked about, in a sense there is this sort of transformation of matter into something else. In this case, it's deliberately elemental. It deliberately assumes uh, certain familiar uh, art forms and has gone in a direction that is where it's trying to go back to find out what went wrong, trying to go back, as it were, to, to a state or condition in an earlier period of making, to try to see what it was that stimulated art making in that earlier period. And the interesting thing I would say is this, what stimulated it is not, as it were, the artist's imagination merely, but the world. I think this, is a, this art is a response to the world. It's an attempt to try to either place meaning in the world or find meaning in the world. And there's that oscillation between the idea that the meaning we feel may be a meaning that we put there, or it may be a meaning that really, truly is there, that I think is something that um, remains as a challenge for artists, as it does for philosophers and others. Um, and I think that although in many ways we might look back to, with much greater confidence and certainty, to the work of earlier um, centuries, and, and quite genuinely, see it as deeply and profoundly religious and as mediating religious truth to us. I also think we have to take seriously artists who in the present day are trying to find means and medium to try to give expression to a, a sensibility that I think is a religious sensibility. It's not a tutored religious sensibility. It's not as it were. It's not been informed by doctrine or dogma. But um, I think these in a way are hope for science. And so they contrast in some ways with some of the work that you showed us at the outset. Um, there's a lot that is bad in contemporary art, but there are some things that I think are very fine indeed. So on that note, I shall stop. Thank you.